All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Brittany Gret, and I am the Collections and Research Public Programming Specialist here at Old Servage Village. And tonight it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar, Clothing the Family, a Museum-Wide Effort. Tonight, we will be discussing the new avenues that Old Sturbridge Village is taking in relation to exhibiting, interpreting, and recreating textiles and textile production in early 19th century New England. And to lead us through this discussion, we have our Old Sturbridge Village Coordinator for Households, Jean Contino, Historical Clothing Coordinator, Carrie Madeira, and our Collections Manager and Curator of Textiles, Rebecca Bell. Before we get started, I have a few technical things to share. This program is being recorded and it will be posted onto the Old Sturbridge Village YouTube page, which I encourage you all to visit. There will also be a question and answer session following our discussion tonight, so I invite our live viewers to submit questions at any point during the presentation in the Q&A feature at the bottom center of your screen. And tonight's webinar is funded by, thanks to, the Bridge Street Sponsorship for Mass Humanities. Bridge Street sponsorships allow funding for free online programs hosted by Massachusetts historical societies, centers, museums, or historical sites such as OSV to enable free access to learning and educational opportunities. So we thank them very much for their support. And now without any further ado, I will pass things over to Jean to begin our discussion. Hello everyone. I'd like to begin with a look at our interpretive sewing program here at Old Stewart Village. When I began at the village back in the 1980s, we had a very dynamic sewing program already. Household sewing, which included things like making tablecloths, towels, and sheets, was done as afternoon work in the households. We made garments, which were worn by our staff, used in laundry demonstrations, and also to furnish households. We also had a strong mending program where we repaired costumes that were regularly worn by our staff members here. We did a daily bonnet making demonstration and then had a quilting program, which included interpreters and volunteers demonstrating both piecing and quilting with regular quilting parties. As staffing needs changed in the museum, the focus began to change to the daily household program rather than as much of a focus on needlework. Although we still continue to do household sewing and we do make simple clothing items as time allows. One goal that the sewing program has had all along has been to be able to show women who were working in the needle trades in the 19th century. So with the construction of our new cabinet making shop, and interpretation of another trade shop, it seemed the ideal time for us to focus on a woman's trade as well. We wanted to be sure that we would explore the whole theme of clothing a family. So including what you could do yourself at home and when you might need to have help with the work. To find out a little bit more about people in the 19th century who were working in the needle trades, I began looking at account books in the Old Sturbridge Village Research Library in 2020. One book that was of particular interest to me was labeled L. Guernsey Dressmaker from Castleton, Vermont, and it covered the years 1834 to 1836. It listed work to be done in groups of days at a time rather than individual daily listings, and then included pages for the purchasing of sewing supplies and others for payment that work was done. During COVID, I worked with a transcript of the diary that had been made in 1992. The author of the diary often spoke of fitting clothing, cutting out, making clothing. She made grave clothes, she quilted, worked on bonnets, and also made carpets. So I started by making a list of her clients and trying to identify which of these might be relatives. Often they were listed just by their first name or as aunt or uncle, and started by looking up the genealogy for the Guernsey family of Castleton, Vermont. And the closest fit I found were Sylvanus and Esther Higley Guernsey and their five children. The dates were all right, the location was right, and many of the people from the diary appeared to be relatives. The only problem I ran into was there was no female family member in that generation that had the first initial L. So once we were back on site after our COVID lockdown, I was able to go back to the original manuscript. It's a really lovely blank book with a marble paper cover and a label which says the Ladies Juvenile Missionary Society. The first few pages of the book, which presumably were the minutes of the society's meetings, were very neatly cut out and the book was repurposed. And the handwriting inside, as you'll see in the next slide, is extremely small and very lightly written in pencil. So if you look at the bottom of that right-hand picture, you can see why it was so difficult to decipher the writing. But I soon realized working with the book a little more and becoming familiar with Zero's handwriting, 
that that was actually the name of the owner of the book. It wasn't L.H. Guernsey. It was Z.H. Guernsey. And on the left, I've blown up that signature as much as I could so that you could see it even in a light pencil. So as I started to search for information for this Z.H. Guernsey, it turns out we had Zerua Higley Guernsey Caswell, who was born in 1805 and died in 1899. She was the daughter of the same Sylvanus and Esther Guernsey that I mentioned earlier. She married a farmer, Meneer Caswell, on March 5th, 1846, when she was 41 years old. And they moved to New York State soon after their marriage, which is just about as the diary ends. What I also found was something called the Caswell Carpet. And it's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's truly magnificent. It's a 12 foot by 12 foot carpet that consists of 80 blocks of wool. Each separate block was embroidered in a change stitch, very possibly a timbre work, and later the blocks were all sewn together. So the motifs used in the carpet are varied. Many include floral and plant motifs. There are a number of birds, people, dogs and cats, and also a seashell. The seashell always makes me wonder because it starts with the missionary society, whether that was an actual seashell she had seen sent back by the missionaries in the South Pacific and that she had copied it. So I'm not sure of that, but it always makes me wonder. Two of my favorite blocks are those that you see in the top left-hand photograph, where Zerua has put her initials, ZHG, and the date 1835. Now the block on the left is also special because it's one of two blocks that have initials thought to be those of Native American students at the local medical college in Castleton. The townspeople were known to take turns boarding the students. And it's very possible that during their stay at the Guernsey house, the two blocks were made. So if you look at the very bottom below the blue flowers, you might just be able to see LFM as the initials on that block. For many years, this amazing carpet remained in the parlor of the Guernsey family home. And I was very excited in the diary to find May 12th, 13th, 14th, 1843, put down my carpet. I also found a couple of references to Zerua making carpets for other people, including January of 1844, when she made a carpet for Mrs. Morse, and in September of 1845, when she mentions making a carpet, a rug, and crickets, or little footstools, for Mrs. A. Zerua's diary gave us a really good look into the type of person who is working in the needle trades that we were hoping to portray here at Old Sturbridge Village. She was not a dressmaker in a high fashion urban shop, but rather someone working in a rural community out of her own home or possibly the home of her clients to fit, cut, and make clothing for local families. Here at Old Sturbridge Village, our pitch house is shown as the home of a mechanics family. It's not unusual for such a center village family in the 1830s to take in boarders. So in this case, we envision the border as a woman who's working in the needle trades, which means we had to set the stage by making a few changes in the pitch house. The first one was to have a good work table. And so on the left-hand side, you'll see a photograph of an original table, which shows the marks of a sewing clamp, which made it very special to us. So we're very lucky to have a reproduction of the same drop leaf table, the original being made by a local cabinet maker, Nathan Lombard, but the reproduction used in our Fitch house. And the center photograph will show you what one of those sewing clamps might have looked like. This one is a reproduction made by one of our blacksmiths, David Caruso, based on an original clamp in the Old Sturbridge Village collection. What it will eventually have is at the top where that semicircular part is, there will be a velvet pin cushion. And it works by allowing the person sewing to pin their work to the velvet pin cushion almost as a third hand while they're sewing. On the right hand side, you'll see a sewing or work table, which we've included. It has leaves which can be opened to extend the top, a drawer at the top with sections for individual sewing tools, and then a lower section which opens as a drawer but has the space of a bag to hold all the pieces for one project. And I think this might be something which Mrs. Child was envisioning when she wrote in her book, The American Frugal Housewife, quote, the true economy of housekeeping is simply the art of gathering up all the fragments so that nothing be lost. I mean by that fragments of time as well as materials, unquote. And I can imagine Mrs. Child thinking, well, if you have all your tools in one place and all the pieces of that shirt, even if you only have 15 minutes, you could do some productive sewing. You're not searching the house looking for your missing tools. So that will be a very important part of our work. 
as well as in the next slide, the display case, which is a custom display case created by our lead cabinet maker, Chris Nassis. It allows us to display original pieces of clothing, tools, and books from our collection, which will frequently be rotated to reflect the current sewing projects being done in the house. It does have UV filters to protect the artifacts and features a locking storage cabin at the base, which will give us a place for tools and individual sewing projects for the people in this program. Another very important part of getting ready for this program was a training session done last January by Carrie Madura and Abby Duell of our historical clothing office. It was an amazing training program for our staff. We began by creating a sampler of stitches from the 1830s in the form of a booklet. So each one includes the sample that's been made along with directions for doing that stitch and uses for the stitch. We also made miniature projects to practice these skills on a small scale, including the apron that you see in the center. And special thanks to our wonderful model, Carrie's cat, for showing one of the caps, which fit perfectly. So these will allow us to be able to show pieces to our guests without taking apart the work that we are doing and also gives the person working a nice reference. If you haven't worked on that particular part of the job for a while, you can go back and look at the miniature to see how it was done. Another very important part of our training was an extensive glossary of fabric names taken from local account store books and garment terms so that we can be a lot more specific in our choice of words for how they were used in this part of Massachusetts in the 1830s. As we look at our needle trades program, we are hoping that we can begin with the work of women in the needle trades who are doing fancier caps, collars, aprons, and capes, as you'll see in the next slide, one of our interpreters working. And then in the future, be able to expand the program to include other specialties such as dressmaking, tailoring, bonnet making, and quilting. These trades do require advanced training in areas such as pattern making, draping, and specialized sewing skills. So we are hoping to build our staff skills with continued training each year. Carrie uses these same skills to create distinctive clothing for each interpreter, volunteer, fellow, and intern in the village. So now I would like to turn the program over to Carrie so that she can tell you more about the work of her office. Thank you so much, Jane. It really takes a village to outfit a village. And I'm so lucky to be able to work on what was built by the costume coordinators that came before me, being able to work with the experience that the historical interpretation team brings, and of course, also having access to the many pieces in our museum collection. The photo you see here is just one small group of interpreters that we costumed for 12 weeks this summer. This is our college interns, 15 out of the 22 or 23 that were here for the summer. And just for those 15 historical historic interpretation interns um, was roughly th 300 pieces of clothing. Um, so it really does take a lot of work. And we also want the, inter the interpreters to look individual while also representing our time in history that we're trying to reflect. As we look back in Old Sturbridge Village's history, and we take a look at this next slide, which shows what people have worn in the past as they've been working here, you really see a broad variety. Now in the photo all the way on the left, this is, goes back to Old Sturbridge Village's, some of its earliest days in the 1940s, um, you see a costumed docent. Now you might be questioning exactly what period of clothing it seems she's wearing. And I like to refer to this as oldie timey era. And this meant that the staff, often members of the family, looked in their attics and looked for clothing that they could put on to give a sense of the past to the visitors that were coming to see mostly the goods and um, materials and tools that the Wells family had collected. Now, as Old Sturbridge Village continued to develop as a living history museum, you saw them try out different techniques. Now, the gentleman that is working in the, um, the center photo you might notice that he is wearing clothing of the periods or late 60s, early 70s. And he is working as a talented craftsman and there was no, no decision to outfit our interpreters and our craftsmen in historical clothing. In fact, for a time, there was even a sign put up during the winter months um, that said, 
please. During the winter months, our craftsmen endeavor to maintain uninterrupted production, really big letters, of craft items. We ask you to watch, but not to interrupt them. Their handcraft products are on sale in the White House where you bought your ticket. So it was production happening there. Yes, so showing absolute skilled trades from the past and demonstrating on many of these um, uh, antique tools, um, but the focus was on the craft and the trade, not on how they were appearing. Fortunately for me and our position here in the historical clothing office, um, that continued to change and more and more focus was put on the clothing that the staff was wearing. So the two remaining pictures that you see represent two different periods in time where they are using more historically accurate patterns and, and um, fabrics and details to pull together a whole look. So the woman who's peeling apples on the right, her dress is actually copied from one in our collections. It dates to roughly um, late 1820s, early 1830s. Her apron could be taken straight from the pages of instruction in the Workwoman's Guide that Jean mentioned and Rebecca will mention again later. Um, her cap, not bad for the, the 1820s, 1830s. Her hair on the other hand, not not so exact as what we'd be looking for. And I'm still trying to decide if she has some nail polish on in this photo. The uh, remaining photograph of the woman who you're seeing in some of her undergarments, her cap has improved, a lot more details, better shape. We're seeing some of those foundations, the shift, the underlayers, and that trend to look more and more into the details continued throughout, um, throughout the decades. As we look at the next slide, you'll see similar dress to the one um, that the woman was wearing apples, uh, uh, peeling apples was wearing. Again, this is probably a late 1820s, early 1830s dress um, in our collection that it's copied from. What you see on the right is the line drawing that matches the pattern that was taken off of the original gown. Now, throughout the now 76 histories of Old Sturbridge Village, the mission for the institution has been to focus on 1790 to 1840. Now, for costuming purposes, at different points in its history, there has been a broader showing of that clothing that the interpreters wear. However, over time, we realize that that's a little muddy when visitors are here to see someone in a 1790s dress and then walk into the next house and see someone in 1810s pants and then walk into the next house and see someone in an 1830s ensemble. So as the museum continued to develop, um, more concentration was put to dress people in the 1830s. So we had a concentrated decade this dress probably fits right on the edge of that, a little bit late 20s, early 30s, but it's a very adaptable dress. Um, you might see from the illustrations that has a fitted waistband, but there's lots of drawstrings to make it a little bit adjustable. That means it's going to fit a lot of our interpreters and several people can wear a dress from year to year. And if you notice on the illustration, it also notes um, a number, 26.33.42. That tells me that this pattern and this dress illustration was copied from one in our collection. And what that means is that it's at some point in history um, that a person working with or for our historical clothing office went to the museum collection, took out a piece, studied it, measured it in depth, in detail to get exactly what the original size was, and then extrapolated that out to keep the proportions and create patterns that would fit our modern size bodies. Because of course we only have one dress or one pair of pants in, in each style, and that only fit that one human that it was made for. We, again, are outfitting upwards of 250 people these days, and in certain times of the museum's history, it was even more than that. And so we need that larger run of sizes. However, what happens at that point when you have to make so many pieces and have to make them so quickly is sometimes some of the details can get lost. Kind of that idea of making a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. We need to cut corners in terms of time and resources. And sometimes that nuanced detail is what needs to get left behind. As we continue improving and continue learning and doing more research, we now have the opportunity these days to go back to some of those originals and see what maybe did get put aside or see what is clearer in photographs now that wasn't as clear looking back. So as we look at the next photo, we see a dress that was studied just last year. 
Now, most of our historical clothing that our interpreters wear, and I should say, I use the terms historical clothing and costume interchangeably. For me, it is the clothing that our staff wears to do their jobs. So in the academic sense, that often refers to as a costume, but we do want our staff to understand that they're wearing clothing. They should be able to do their work in whatever they have on. Now, so the majority of our historical clothing is made by contract seamstresses and tailors, but they're working under our direction with our patterns, our fabrics, our instructions. We're fortunate to be working with a lot of really talented and experienced um, individuals that have backgrounds in historical clothing. So they're often able to push back against us and say, hey, this doesn't seem really period accurate. Are you sure you want me to do it that way? This dress is one example. Now the brown silk dress you see is one from our collection. Um, it's a lovely, probably um, later 1830s dress that has the fan front that is indicative of later, the later part of the decade and um, wide waistband, but it's relatively close to the normal, the natural waist. And we have a beautiful pattern in a number of sizes. I think this one we have in size eight to about size, um, a modern size 18. And I asked one of our dressmakers to make this for us last summer. And it was being made for our music fellow, Lisa. And she had some pretty specific needs and how she needed to move in the dress. She plays, um, the instrument she plays, she needed a broader range of movement. She needed to be able to stretch her shoulders a little bit more. And we knew that this was all possible in the period because of course women were playing musical instruments then too. And so we went back to look at the original garment to see where changes might have diverged from the original onto the pattern. One of the most exciting things we found was that the torso length was a little bit longer than what our patterns was. So that means the dress fits a little bit high and tighter underneath the arm, which gives you a broader range of motion. Perfect for our musician. The other detail came to our cuff. And so looking at the next slide, you can see this in really close detail. Now that's the cuff going closing around one of the wrists. Um, behind my thumb is a hook on the back side, and it closes by hooking on to that small thread loop, that piece that looks a little bit like a, ca a caterpillar on the silk. And in the pattern we had, which otherwise really, really well drafted and had a lot of, of details to it, but the pattern for the cuff was rounded on both edges. And you might notice looking at this photograph that it's only rounded on the side that my thumb is holding. The other side is very straight. Now for those seamstresses and costume historians and um, other sewers on this, you might know that adding piping in a round edge to go around all four sides of an edge, like a cuff, can be really challenging. It's, it's hard to start and stop the piping neatly so it tucks away invisibly and has a neat join. Um, our pattern told us to do it that way. Our contract seamstress looked at it and went like, this is gonna look really messy when I'm done. It, are you sure that that's right? Can you take another look for me? So we did and was able to work with Rebecca and um, others in the collections to get our eyes um, and literally my clean hands on this dress to look at that detail and realize, no, actually it's a straight edge on one side. So there is a neat and easy way to end the piping. This makes it actually both easier to hand sew if someone wants to recreate this stitch for stitch. And it also makes it much easier for our contract sewers to do the interior machine stitching that we require because that's what our resources allow. And so it's been details like that that allow us to create unique looks for each person um, as we make new garments going forward. It also allows us to have a little bit more individuality between our costumes. So the dress at right in the beautiful black, pink and um, purple and green, this is one of my favorite fabrics um, that we have in our costumes at the village. Um, it has that fan front detailing. It's a little bit lost in a photo. It looks much more impressive if you look up um, any of our musician photos through our social media, you'll see Lisa wearing this. It's a favorite dress of hers because it does meet so many of her specific needs. Um, but that cuff detail is on there. We were able to incorporate that in. We were able to incorporate that longer torso to have it sit better on her. This was a one-off kind of working with one dressmaker at a time. We realized pretty quickly that we needed to or wanted to go back and do this with a lot more of the garments. So we are very fortunate that we um, have the support of the Dora Foundation and they have funded 
positions for two costume fellowships since 2020. Um, our first costume fellow is now our historical clothing associate, Abby Duell, who you'll see helping in some uh, photographs coming up. And then our current fellow is Ray Cook. In the next photo, you'll see the first project Ray worked on while he was here. His fellowship focuses about um, three fifths on just looking at our patterns and comparing them to the extant garments, much as the way we did quickly with the one dress with our contract dressmaker. This first vest is the first one um, Ray kind of fully patterned on his own. And I apologize for sort of the magic effect. It's very, very narrow, um, like less than one eighth inch stripe. It actually looks that crazy in person when you're trying to work on it for a long time. So we won't keep it on screen for too long. Um, but Ray was able to look at this, was able to measure out very specifically inch by inch what the dimensions for this vest were. And that's what you see reflected on the graph paper in the images to the right. He was also able to capture construction details and any notes he thought would be of relevance, both for us making clothing in um, our office, as well as to add to the collections database. So this information can live with the um, collections record so that future research researchers and historians can see that a lot of this work is already done and they can build on that going forward. Now this was a vest that we did have patterned already. We have this vest and again, roughly a size 34 chest all the way up to about a 50 size chest. Um, it's a traditional man's garment. And some of the details that had changed in the patterns that we had pre-existing was that this um, low point at the center front at the bottom of the buttons had been straightened. So the vest was cut straight across the bottom. It also had more interfacing and stiffening built into the collar of our modern patterns. And the back was lined. So there's two layers to the back of the vest. Whereas if you look closely in the photograph, you'll notice a hem along the right hand edge um, facing us um, of the back. That's a single layer of linen. And when you think about how warm it's been this summer, you can only imagine how much our interpreters would appreciate having only one extra layer over their shirt rather than two layers of lining fabric. And this vest also has a very breathable linen lining in the back. So again, really comfortable for summer wear and having a New England provenance, you know, tells us that you know, these were logical people dressing for the weather as they needed. So once Ray was able to take all of this, um, looking at our next picture, you can see him working to take those patterns, one more crazy photo of the vest um, looking uh, all jumbled. And then you see the copy that Ray made. Um, now he made this one by hand for himself to work through all of those steps. So we now not only have a record of all of the pattern pieces for the original, we have a machine sewn copy of the um, original size that exactly matches the collections piece. So we can manipulate that and look at it and try it on different bodies and see how it fits. Things we can't do with the museum collection. Um, Rebecca definitely says no anytime I suggest that. And um, Ray also took step-by-step -step photos of this one that he made. So we have a record of every step and the, the order of construction steps that seem to match most closely. This will hopefully allow us to have um, our contract tailors and dressmakers make things more easily. It'll allow our staff within the skilled needle trades program to make it more easily. And then hopefully down the road, it will allow for us to have patterns and such going forward for the, um, the costume historian or costume enthusiast to make on their own and also to make it available for um, other institutions that are focusing on in the 1830s. Um, it's been really exciting to see Ray focus on this. And he also, has been able to take this pattern and a few others and draft them up to different sizes. So the original vest is probably roughly a size 34, 35. So pretty small for most of us today. Um, but he was also able to work that against a modern drafting block. So for this particular vest, we now have a 36, a 38, and a 40. And those are currently being made and being born in the village. So we're able to test those fits out. We're able to see if people really are more comfortable with a single back lining. They are, in case anyone was wondering. Um, we'll see what happens in the winter. And, um, and that's what we're going to continue to do. So Ray is studying the pieces, patterning them, um, in some cases, drafting different sizes. So this is work that is both contributing to the background history of what we do, but also is very forward-looking as well. Now with Ray's 
working on that and supporting the skilled needle trades program and also supporting our historical clothing office, it was extra fun to kind of bring this all together and bring it to life in as an interpretive event during textile weekend. And this was with the, um, the help of all of those that took part in our women in the needle trades sewing training earlier this year, plus a number of extra volunteers. And I, I love this photograph um, because it's sort of, it looks very calm and happy and everything is going smoothly. And this is definitely that, you know, ducks smoothing smoothly on the surface when we're all paddling like crazy underneath. Um, because the next, um, the next slide that you'll see um, is more the, you know, how much was happening behind the scenes. We had a total of about 11 people working on this dress over the course of two days. Um, starting from the photo in the upper right, um, you see um, our uh, model, Lindsay, who is our current domestic management fellow. Um, we chose to make the dress for her because she's going to need a nicer dress, um, especially going into the Christmas by candlelight season. And, and she has a longer torso, so it helped. You know, it was good to be able to fit someone um, who we might not have had extra dresses ready to wear for her. So what you see in that illustration is several people sewing um, piping and bias strips. And then the woman in the pink dress in the um, foreground, her name's Angela, a wonderful volunteer with us. She's working on the skirt. And meanwhile, Lindsay and I in the back, I'm also wearing the pink, she, we're draping a bodice on her. And so by doing that, we take fabric, hold it up to her body, pin it in place to create the base pattern, um, keeping in mind the proportions of the original dress we're trying to copy, and basically keep pinning and tucking in place into and cutting the extra fabric away until it looks just like the lining of the dress that we're going to make. That process by an experienced dressmaker would take maybe 10 minutes, if that, and it's what you need to have to be able to build on that and to be able to make the outside layers of the dress. Um, demonstrating it and talking through each step, because of course this was a learning process for all of us as well as for the visitors. Um, it probably took about 30, 35 minutes um, start to finish. And we found that that was the case with a lot of the steps that we were doing. We were learning as we went on, um, which was really exciting. We were able to condense a lot of the steps of making the dress so that everyone in our skilled needle trades program could see the different aspects of that. They didn't have to wait until you know, we got through 10 hours of dressmaking to then see the next step. Um, it was a really nice condensed version and it was extra gratifying to have so many visitors stopping by to check our progress. A little bit nerve wracking too, but extra exciting to you know, know that they were following and they were excited to see how, how we did with this. Um, Going clockwise around this, um, the photo in the bottom center um, shows um, Jean and, um, and another volunteer, um, Marcy, and they're actually working on piecing a quilt. And that was another activity we had in the second part of the house in Fitch. And that allowed those that didn't have a dress piece to work on at any given time, they could go work on quilt pieces. And that quilt block is one, this quilt um, is made up of probably gonna be about 80 blocks. It's another copy of one in our collection. And the original quilt from 1831 is made up of discarded dress pieces. So we're doing the same thing. So for dresses that can no longer be worn by our interpreters or handkerchiefs, um, in some cases, even some vests and some shirts, those are getting cut up and sewn into this quilt, which Fingers crossed when it eventually gets done, we'll go on display in Richardson or one of the other buildings. Um, so it's really great to kind of have that beginning of the life cycle of a dress and then the end of the life cycle of a dress all in one building. To the left of that, continuing clockwise, you have Angela again cutting the bias strips for us and no rotary cutters. Um, none of this was drawn on. We were entirely working with just scissors, pins, needles, um, thread, and some beeswax. I think that was about it. And then we did make sure to pause for some treats now and then in the upper photo. Um, that is definitely probably catching us with pretty much all of our mouths full of some delicious peach water and um, some gingerbread nuts and um, all sorts of uh, treats that the interpretive staff made for us at Fitch as well throughout the weekend. Now, 
this craziness kind of continued throughout both days. And in front of the public, we only showed the steps that would have been done historically. So we didn't bring out um, pencils and rulers um, or not extensive rulers and tape measures. Um, we didn't kind of check things against any paper patterns because that wasn't really something that was done in the 1830s. We just used what was in front of us. Full disclosure, I did take everything back to our office once we had fitted um, Lindsay's bodice. So we could capture that going forward. So we do have a pattern and we have a record that can be reused. And in the next slide, you'll see what that pattern looks like and the steps it took us to go through the bodice. So this is solely the front of the dress. So you're not seeing the back here, it's just the front. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you will see um, the center line, so the black divide, so you have a left front and a right front. Those are the lining pieces. The one thing um, that you can't see here is there are two darts. As we move to the second photo along the top, you will see that each lining piece has a piece of the printed cotton fabric. And this is fabric that was produced from an 1830s sample book. So really, um, it was a nice, it's a nice quality quilting fabric for today. Um, it would be sort of an average, um, nice, but not that nice um, quilt pattern, uh, fabric pattern from the past. Um, it doesn't have really clear registration marks. It's a little bit fuzzy, um, but still lovely and bright and a combination of different colors. So in making this bodice, you have two pieces that are laid down over the lining. We basted those in place to hold them there while we continued on. So by the second photo, we're already up to four pieces. As we move on to the right-hand upper photo, we're now adding four more pieces. So we're adding the two small kind of almost rectangular pointed pieces at the bottom, but they each have a piece of piping along the top. So piece of covered piping, um, small um, pointed rectangle on each side. So our bodice is now up to the eight pieces. As we drop down to the lower left, we're adding one more piece on top of that. It's almost a yoke piece that's going to fill in the top of the bodice. So now we're up to nine pieces. That's going to get gathered in at the shoulders and um, starting to get gathered in at the center, um, center front behind those smaller rectangular pieces. We are going to add two darts. Um, they're not illustrated well. It's a little bit tough because the fabric's busy. So we were at nine pieces. That brings us up to 11 pieces um, of, of construction materials. And then the very last thing is that gathered is tucked into those two small um, pointed rectangles on the right. And then the center is sewn up front with yet another piece of piping. So just for the unfinished front, it was 12 different pieces. So because there were so many pieces, it did allow us to spread the work across different people. So we had, you know, one person working on a bunch of the left and a bunch of the right. And then finally, as we got smaller and smaller um, or more connected pieces, then it passed on to one person. And last but not least, I want to show you the image that was taken just eight hours ago. Here we have Lindsay in the, what looks like the finished dress next to the dress that we were copying and using the proportions and design features of. Now, I say it was taken eight hours ago because clearly we didn't finish the dress in a weekend. We got really far. Um, we had an illustration that day that showed the dress. Um, it was illustrated with just one sleeve and that's as far as we got with the dress that day. We had a bodice with one sleeve. We have since gone back to add some more details. And even this morning as we dress Lindsay in this photograph, we um, it's pinned in the back because we still wanna do some fine tuning um, fitting that we could not do on the scale of um, what we were doing out in the museum. Lindsay is taller than average, as I mentioned, but also the original dress is shorter than average. We figure Lindsay is um, Lindsay's almost six feet. We have a um, dress for someone who is probably only about four foot nine. So it looks out of proportion, but honestly, that's probably why the dress was saved because it was too small to fit on too many um, people after it was made for this one individual. And this is the dress that we're really excited to be able to bring back out on Friends Day. 
in September and Lindsay and um, the dress and Jean will be talking about that as part of the programs on September 17th. And I'm even more excited that after that, this dress will eventually rotate into the museum exhibit um, that Rebecca is going to tell you all about. And really excited to be able to see that on a regular basis and to be able to see so many of the inspiration pieces and the extant collections we work from um, just a few steps away from our door. So thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Carrie, and welcome everybody. Um, as you've seen from both Jean and Carrie, our museum collections and research library primary resource materials really form the um, foundation, pardon the pun, for a lot of Old Sturbridge Village's programming and initiatives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about developing our newest exhibit, which is entitled Needle and Thread, the Art and Skill of Clothing in Early 19th Century Family, and a little bit about our exhibit process and how it intersects with other programming in the village. In the curatorial department here at OSB, we've really made a concerted effort to focus on a collaborative approach with our exhibits, especially tying exhibits to thematic programming like Textile Weekend and initiatives throughout the village, especially ones, as you were hearing from Carrie, in the store clothing office. The inception for Needle and Thread really had its roots in early discussions surrounding the themes of women's household work, particularly sewing and textile tasks, and how and when those household sewing tasks might have overlapped or been aided by individuals working in skilled trades, such as dressmaking and tailoring that Jean was speaking about. Uh, the focus on the theme of clothing a family for this year's Textile Weekend event, along with ongoing program development around this topic, meant that an exhibit highlighting OSV's clothing collection and related objects was really a natural fit. So we always try to find a way to connect our museum collections objects and uh, research library materials to interpretive programming, and the collections are really, really important to really what the visitors will see and experience out in the village. So along with these collaborative efforts and larger exhibits, we've also been exploring other ways we can physically get more of our objects out in front of the public um, for them to enjoy and learn from, such as the new object case Jean showed you in the Fitch House, or show and tell programs uh, that we do. We're able to bring out collections objects and talk to guests about them. And that usually coincides with special events like we did for Textile Weekend. Um, but that aside, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our exhibit and our main exhibit here and how we began to develop the story and the themes and choosing objects that help tell that story all the way through creating the layout and designing mounts uh, with some of the challenges along the way. We at Old Star Ridge Village have a fabulous collection composed of approximately 50,000 objects, ranging from things like large vehicles and machines and buildings, all the way down to the smallest sewing supplies like pins and needles. In particular, we have an absolutely wonderful textile collection composed of everything from needlework samplers and quilts and blankets and other household items and, of course, clothing and accessories. And as we talked about an increasing focus on sewing for the family, it was natural to explore the ways in which we could support this effort with our collections. And the clothing collection in particular is really a wonderful way, I think, to make connections with guests between then and now. Most of the clothing pieces will be at least somewhat recognizable to other individuals and things like choosing what to wear and how to get it are still questions that we contend with today. So really, it was ideal for making connections to our modern visitors. And as uh, luck would have it, I use the word luck incredibly loosely, one of our exhibit buildings needed rather unexpected and urgent HVAC repairs, uh, which necessitated deinstalling the exhibit that had been mounted in that space. And we quickly realized that this presented an ideal moment to consider a new textile exhibit in conjunction with the annual textile weekend, the new programming and the new initiatives out of the historic clothing department. And we'd long been talking about this and planning for it and just really had never had that moment where it seemed like the time was right. So the space becoming available because we had to empty it out um, really became kind of the impetus for turning this space now into hopefully a rotating textile exhibit for at least the next few years. And the HVAC, for those who want to know, is, is indeed fixed and up and running, and therefore I am breathing much easier. Um, so in the next slide, you'll see a few of the quotes that were kind of running around our minds as we're developing this exhibit. And for me, the theme of the exhibit really started with a quote from Lucy Larkham that you can see at the top of the screen from her 1889 book, A New England Girlhood. Um, and that had really caught my eye. Uh, in this book, she's writing about growing up in the village time period. She was born in 1824 and in Massachusetts. And her quote is, I somehow or somewhere got the idea while I was a small child that the chief end of woman was to make clothes for mankind. This thought came over me with a sudden dread one Sabbath morning when I was a toddling thing led along by my sister behind my father and mother. As they walked arm in arm before me, I lifted my eyes from my father's heels to his head and mused, 
how tall he is and how long his coat looks and how many thousand, thousand stitches there must be in his coat and pantaloons. And I suppose I've got to grow up and get a husband and put all those little stitches into his coat and pantaloons. Oh, I never, never can do it. A shiver of utter discouragement went through me. With that task before me, it hardly seemed as if life were worth living. So as an aside, Lucy, um, who became a very noted poet and writer, among other pursuits, um, chose not to marry. I have to imagine it had nothing to do with sewing um, and everything to do with really wanting to remain independent, but I found that kind of, kind of interesting. So many 19th century primary resources, as you can see on the screen there. Um, diaries, day books and the like reference clothing construction and clothing care. Sometimes it's just a notation as simple as wash today or knit some, but other entries are much more specific, noting what type of garment was worked on or the material that was used or the intended recipient or who else was helping or in uh, the space while this was being worked on. But in quite a few sources, it seems like nearly every day had at least some time, even in small part, dedicated to some type of sewing or maintenance task relating to the family's clothing. So this was a big job. This was a time consuming job for families. And sort of with little Lucy's abject horror in mind and her apparent lot in life, we set about to broadly think about the themes we wanted to focus on as part of the story of clothing the family and themes that would then be reflected and reinforced in activities and interpretive stories out in the village as well. So in the next slide, you'll see first and foremost, we wanted to highlight the breadth of the task of clothing a family. Um, so we're exhibiting really just a small sampling of clothes from our collection, ranging from uh, well-constructed and sturdy undergarments like ships and petticoats and shirts to the various garments for all of the family members from infants and children all the way up through adults. And as I mentioned before, diaries and day books and reminiscences are full of references to sewing and cutting and mending and knitting, as well as laundering and ironing. So a big job that took multiple hands, countless hours to manage. And I also think it's important to note that while most 19th century individuals didn't quite have the packed closets that we tend to today, and I'm definitely guilty of this, um, there were still a lot of garments to keep track of when you consider the number of family members that were in a household and the different types of garments that they would need and the layers each family member would have. And like today, a lot of individual choice was probably involved. Uh, questions like, do I spend money on material for new garments or spend that money elsewhere and patch or alter and make the old ones do? You might find a story of a rural farm wife who may not be the most economical who's decided that she desperately needs multiple fancy gowns. Or maybe you see a daguerreotype from the 1840s of an older individual wearing clothes a decade or so out of date, but maybe that was the clothing style they felt most comfortable in and didn't feel the need to update their wardrobe to reflect a newer style. Um, as Jean mentioned, advice authors like Lydia Ride Child and Catherine Beecher, um, some of my favorite resources, noted that these trends, um, of course, isn't related to their advice about the evils of not economizing. Um, Lydia Ride Child in particular noted that people of moderate fortune have an unquestionable right to dispose of their hundreds as they please, all the while emphasizing, of course, that they can make personal choices, but they should take care to budget and spend wisely. And Catherine Beecher similarly noted that in regard to dress, a lady will sometimes purchase an elegant and expensive article. <clears throat> which instead of attracting admiration from the eye of taste will merely serve as a decoy to the painful contrast of all the other parts of the dress and advising women that they should be sensible of their, and of course their families, actual needs with respect to clothing. So even in the 19th century, it often boiled down to personal preferences and household economic choices like it might today. I should also mention here that, um, and Carrie mentioned it too, that the exhibit will be staying up through 2023 and into 2024 and hopefully, fingers crossed, through 2025. And we absolutely will not be leaving the textiles in place that long. Um, so we built into the exhibit a schedule of changeovers. So the overall themes will stay the same, but the individual garments will be changed out. And this is fantastic because we have a finite space. So this will allow us to focus on different subsections of the garment collection. Um, we might bring out winter garments next or outerwear, fancier garments like the silk gowns, um, all the way to work clothes. So we'll really be able to explore the range of clothing items over the course of the exhibit and bring as many pieces out to the public as we're able. One challenge is really that it is a finite space and you can't possibly put out every single garment that you'd like to, and I try, trust me. Um, so one is actually uh, the dress that's in the upper left corner of the previous slide, and you might recognize that as the one Carrie has beautifully recreated. Originally, this was going to be in the exhibit for the first rotation, and we lent it to Carrie and had a stand-in dress and realized that the other dress um, that I had planned on putting in, which is an earlier 1832 dress, the two dresses together did not play nicely together. So we ended up saying, okay, one adult dress and the other dress we'll just save for the, the next rotation. So it actually worked out quite well, um, despite my trying to put as much as I could into that center case. 
Um, so in the next slide, we felt that it was important to not just focus on clothing construction, but also the entire life cycle of the family's clothing. While sewing a garment certainly took time and skill, the task of maintaining the family's clothing probably took a lot more time in the long run between laundering and ironing and patching and darning and altering. And this is again emphasized in period diaries, but also advice books like Catherine Beecher's Treatise on Domestic Economy and Lydia Murray Child's The American Frugal Housewife that we mentioned earlier. Um, Lydia Murray Child recommends um, right up front, uh, attend to the mending in the house at least once a week. So clearly this is a task that needs to be ongoing. Um, maintenance was an integral part of the story of creating and caring for the family's clothing. And we really wanted to bring out maintenance tools to reflect that from our collection, like an early 19th century washing machine and washboards and irons and trivets, and even an ultra utilitarian object like the humble clothespin, which hardly ever gets put out on exhibit. So it was important for us to tell a broader story beyond the garments themselves and really take it through that life cycle. What happens after the garment's been made? How do you make it last? Um, so even here, we could talk about choices individual families were making too to purchase a newfangled washing machine or use tubs and washboards, to have a special ironing set like Catherine Beecher recommended or use blankets and sheets pinned over a kitchen table, patch or darn a garment or make something new. In a lot of ways, we really live in a disposable society and are really apt to throw things away rather than trying to extend their life, especially with things that may not have much of a cost to start. And then and now there are choices you're really choosing even today time spent fixing them versus money spent replacing it. And I remember giving a tour from um, our, of our collection storage building to our Discovery Adventure Summer Program participants. So these were kids who were about eight to 10 years old. And we were talking about sewing and knitting. And then when we got to darning and mending, they were shocked, they were surprised, they were kind of horrified. The people would have gone to the trouble of patching or darning their socks, their stockings, instead of just buying new ones like we do today. And I have to imagine that the reverse would be true, that in the 19th century, folks would have been aghast at our tendency to throw clothes away before trying to repair them. So um, another thing that we wanted to highlight in the exhibit is the fact that while it was a very large and daunting task, when you consider the family size of seven or eight or nine people, on average, it wasn't done in isolation. So women had networks of assistance from family members to advice literature to professionals they could hire. And we kind of wanted to dismantle the myth a little bit that like Lucy's quote, women had to sew every little stitch themselves. Um, kind of like that idea that everyone in the 19th century was self-sufficient in other areas, like growing their own food and raising you know, their own crops. There were broader social and commercial networks at work even beyond the urban centers uh, nearby Worcester and Boston out to more rural areas like us here in central New England. And also that includes the availability of imported textiles from places as far afield as Europe and Asia that are coming over and available for folks to purchase. We're also looking at letters written from friends and family members, including little snippets about purchasing material and attention to particular fashion details they're seeing. Another way trends are moving out towards more rural areas with actually pretty surprising speed in some cases. And I believe it was in one of the letters between Salem Town and his wife um, while he was away in Boston on a business trip, and he's noting fashion details. So, for instance, he, he talked about don't line the cloaks in red or everyone will know we're from the country or noting how many buttons were supposed to be on a particular garment to make sure it was keeping up with the latest styles or talking about purchasing wadding for a police or being entrusted by his wife to purchase some fabric for her new gown. Um, also, lots of advice literature and periodicals are popping up in our period, too, and again, giving this larger network um, some play and offering glimpses of the latest styles out of London or Paris, like the Ladies Pocket Magazine and Godey's uh, fashion plates that you see, and work manuals, uh, work advice manuals, rather, like the Workman's Guide, um, published in 1838 provided practical instructions for constructing various garments, instructions for details like sleeves and bodices like you see in the plate there, and even just general advice on what tools to keep on hand, how to choose the right material, and helpful hints on maintaining and mending garments. So lots of resources for um, folks in the 19th century if they needed them. It was also important for us to include professionals um, with skilled and specialized training, such as tailors and tailoresses, seamstresses, dressmakers, milliners, and women who use their sewing skills to earn income. So Jean talked a lot about Zerua, who also became uh, kind of uh, foremost in our minds as we're designing this exhibit. Um, she's just one example, her accounts showing all the sewing activities for local community members and expenditures on supplies and materials related to her trade. Another one uh, is William Kate, who's, you see one page from his advice book in the top there uh, for an entry for Samuel Greeley. And he was a tailor in Salisbury, New Hampshire, working from the early 1800s to the 1830s. And he references providing services for patterning and cutting all the way up to sewing full garments for his climates, um, such as you see for Samuel Greeley, who got things cut like a surtout. He had cutting a great coat, altering a coat and trimmings. 
And William Kate was active for quite a long time and often entries like Samuel Greeley's show dates over multiple years demonstrating that William Kate was probably very well respected at his trade. Um, so Samuel Greeley has entries from 1810 all the way up to I think 1823 is the latest one for him. Um, and even in a place like rural North Brookfield, Massachusetts, Massawaka remembered his mother seeking out Aunt Debbie, who was a local tailoress who was very much in demand for a new coat. And he said, mother is all prepared for the business in hand. The table is drawn out. The cloth is spread upon it. Aunt Debbie gets out her shears and thimble. Mother brings forward her pressing board. And now a grand council of war is held about the proposed garment. How shall it be cut? How lined? How trimmed? How long shall it be? What the fashion of the collar? What with the cuffs? All are important matters. So Aunt Debbie seems to be not only a very skilled at construction, but presumably knowledgeable about um, more up-to-date styles as well. And often professionals were not just sought out for this skill, but also their expertise and knowledge of the newer styles. And I should mention too, there was also a burgeoning kind of ready-made clothing market beginning to show up in newspaper advertisements, um, particularly in more urban areas like Worcester and Boston. So you see one of those examples um, from an 1844 newspaper on the side of the screen. So there are lots of um, lots of resources for folks in the 19th century. And unlike little Lucy's idea, it wasn't necessary that you had to sew every single little stitch. So I have to imagine Lucy must have had a little uh, breath of relief. But really, the story of clothing a family is much broader and more complex than one might initially assume. So certainly a lot of this work fell to the women, but even in the early 19th century, it wasn't a job done in total isolation. And hopefully that's a story that not only will guests get in the exhibit, but also throughout um, the village as they interact with costume historians and spaces like the Fitch House. So once we had these general themes mapped out, uh, choosing objects to flesh out the story was kind of the next step. And as I mentioned, we wanted to take a broader approach with respect to objects we're displaying. So not only showing full garments, but accessories and sewing tools, maintenance tools, advice books, and um, other primary source materials from our research library. As you can see from the pictures, we were a little bit limited because the layout of the room and the cases were fixed and uh, designed with the previous exhibit in mind, which had a lot of tiny things. So our process involved a little rearranging with respect to the order of the individual case themes. Um, so basically we were developing the theme and then breaking the theme down into smaller sub themes by case in the space, identifying objects and resources that would fit within each theme that would help tell that story. And again, that proved a little challenging as we're dealing with finite spaces and cases that are a little bit shallow. So that limited us in some ways um, as to the objects that we could put in those. And then finally, when we worked that out, we got to layout and mounting um, and began designing case by case and section by section appropriate layout and mounts for each object. While this was happening, other things were happening behind the scenes too. So we had development of the brand, uh, the logo, the font, the design. Um, at the same time, thanks to our lead designer, Lex, and needless to say, what the public doesn't see with an exhibit um, is all of the previous iterations, the designs that didn't make the cut, all the passes, making sure we could get as close to ADA standards as possible for accessibility and legibility, color corrections, objects that we wanted to use but decided were ultimately too fragile or not quite right, and tweaking any number of details. So lots and lots of iterations and versions as we went forward with the exhibit. Another thing we wanted to ensure, because it's a very open space in a lot of ways too, is that each case would stand more or less on its own, regardless of the order in which visitors experience the exhibit. So as you can see, it's not really necessarily a linear space. When you go through the front door, which is the view you're seeing now, you're immediately drawn to that big case, but you don't see the cases that are over to your left and over to your right that kind of encircle the room. So we wanted to make sure that each label would make sense on its own rather than being dependent on previous text. So it really wouldn't matter which order people saw the exhibit in, give them a little freedom there. So once we had the key pieces in place, the introduction, the case themes, the labels, and the final object list, it was time to start finally installing. And we did nearly everything in-house from creating boxes and mannequin pole supports to padded rollers, um, wall mounting systems. And this was the point in the process where things started to come together. The exhibit started to take shape and where I started breathing again and stopped panicking about running out of time. Because up until this point, when we started installing, there was uh, chaos everywhere. And uh, we had tables set up with all of our tools. And it was really um, it de definitely a little panic inducing at times until things started to fall into place. So the center case um, really proved to be one of the more challenging aspects as it was the space where most of the big garments were gonna be displayed. It was really our only space to display the full garments and creating shaped and padded mannequin forms definitely required a little practice, a little artistry, a lot of patience as we worked at carving down epiphone forms because as you saw in Carrie's uh, portion of the presentation, some of our garments are very petite and very small. So we have to make sure that 
what we're putting them on uh, in terms of an ethafilm form is much smaller so we can build it out rather than trying to squeeze them in and worry about uh, potential damage. So we carved down the ethafilm quite a bit and then built them back up with poly batting and tool and other materials. And getting the proper shape was key. And sometimes it took us a few durations of carving down and building up and carving down and building up to get the mount shapes where we wanted them before we put the garment on. Um, we used a lot of sleeve supports and petticoats. Um, both muslin and tulle were used to support the women's and girls' garments, while the men's garments needed um, actually armature legs and arms wrapped in batting and nylon to create a shape that would hold the garment. So the cotton tail coat um, is one, and we had a slide of it a few back, uh, one that was actually one of the more challenging garments to mount since as a lighter weight cotton material didn't have a lot of structure in and of itself. So we created some armature wires um, and shoulder joints to help keep the tail coat arms at a more realistic angle for human form. Without that structure, we had it on a form and just looked very unnatural at the shoulders and arms and it didn't, it didn't look right. Um, so this is all thanks to uh, conservator Joanna Tower um, who came out in the summer to provide a workshop for us on some new techniques for mannequin and form making um, and let us play with some new materials that we hadn't tried before. So we did this uh, as a staff, but also our college interns and fellows were able to participate too. So that was fantastic. And this whole process um, with the mannequins was really one of the most rewarding, I think, as each garment started to take shape and the original wearer's body shape started to appear. Um, it was a little bit, it was, kind of gave you chills when you saw the garment on the form and saw it coming to life almost. It was also a little challenging at the same time trying to troubleshoot when a garment didn't look quite right. So we'd add a little more tool here, a little more padding there, carve down certain parts. Um, we actually had to extend some parts of the ethafoam, uh, especially at the shoulders. Uh, so we have a pair of stays on display and the straps were hitting right off the shoulder of some of the ethafoam forms we were starting with. And it wasn't supporting the garment well enough. So we actually had to add in extra shoulders so that the straps would be well supported. So that was a little, little fun troubleshooting right there. So as we take a look at some of the images from the finished exhibit, I really have to give a humongous shout out and thank you to everyone here at OSV, especially uh, my fellow colleagues in the research and collections department here who really helped bring this together our call, um, fellows, our college interns. So really this was truly a team effort. And the exhibit I think really highlights one of OSV's strengths, which is bringing together interpretive programming, the museum collections, and really enriching the visitor's experience through this whole collaboration. So definitely come back if you haven't had a chance to see it and kind of see it through its uh, iterations. And before we conclude with q and I wanted to highlight a new publication we're working on um, to keep your eyes out for this project was designed to complement the ongoing work with interpretive programming, this exhibit, and the patterning work out of the historic clothing office, uh, studying extant garments from our collection. And this book will highlight objects from OSV's collection and research library, again, telling the story of clothing in New England family con construction all the way through maintenance and beyond. But what makes this really unique is we'll also be including um, some of the patterns that Carrie referenced for some of the garments that are pictured in this book for folks who would like to take on the challenge of recreating them themselves. So this has been an enormous undertaking. We're really excited by how things are coming together. Hopefully this will be available later this fall. And we really hope that it'll be the first in a series really of similar publications focusing not only on OSV's fantastic collections, but also including some kind of some patterns or hands-on element, which I think really connects to the core of OSV's educational mission. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. That was a wonderful discussion. So we do have a few questions before we head out for the evening. Um, we've, we've answered a few as we've gone along. Thank you, Jean. Um, one we do have a couple for Carrie, actually. Um, Paula is wondering if Lindsay's dress is front opening. Hi, Paula. Uh, no, this dress is back opening. So as we were piecing it together, it does have a center front seam that is piped, but it has a row of hooks and eyes up the back. The other interesting detail about this dress um, is that it is actually a bodice completely separately finished from the skirt. So the skirt is finished with a waistband and then it is only basted to the inside of the bodice, which is a new technique we're adapting. In fact, like that's the, that's the dress right behind me. Um, we took it back off Lindsay and need to finish it up. Uh, but yeah, it's two completely separate pieces and they both open up the back. Awesome. Um, we have one question from Jillian. She is wondering if it was common for diaries to be written in pencil rather than ink. Does anyone have any insights to that question? We, we have both. We definitely have some that are written in ink, some that are written in pencil. 
um, a few come to mind, like Zerua's, we have another um, series from Mary Avery White, who wrote very, very tiny. So some of these diaries are incredibly hard to, to transcribe and take uh, a magnifying glass in some cases, or scans that you can blow up to really um, see what they're writing about, but lots of information there. Awesome. So Sam is wondering, were most people buying clothing from tailors or were they making their clothes at home? And tied to that, were there any commercial patterns available in the 20s and 30s? So, um, hi Sam, uh, great to hear from you. And um, no, there weren't really commercial patterns yet um, for men's clothing or women's clothing. There are just the beginnings of um, instructions being printed in um, fashion magazines or ladies magazines. I want to say 1829, 18, late 1820s is the earliest you even see sort of illustrations of you make the shape cap and, and some text description of how to go about making that. Um, it really doesn't get a jump start until the, um, until the late 40s, um, 1850s. For men's garments and more structured women's garments like um, cloaks and um, outer coats and things like that, you do have the um, expansion of tailoring guides and manuals, which were step-by-step -step drafting instructions. Some are better than others. Some um, tailors were just trying to make a buck selling the books. Um, some really did develop drafting systems. And that actually is another area that we use to um, make some of our clothing here at OSV and something we're actually planning on expanding on, um, taking some of those drafting techniques, but feeding them into 2022 drafting programs to kind of spit out patterns for us. So we're developing that as well. As far as most people um, buying clothing from tailors or making clothes at home, it's going, this is one of those, it depends questions. Um, we do have, um, Simpler garments, specifically speaking about the 1830s, um, we are seeing um, more often women in the household making things like pants, easy unlined um, jackets, spencers, um, that they might be making for their own family members. You're also seeing women in the community making, again, some of those simpler garments um, for others in the community that they're getting paid to do that work. The ready-made clothes are primarily being sold to, um, to kind of a lot of the working class um, that might be young men kind of getting started in their life that might not be married yet, that might not have family nearby to make for them. Um, so that seems to be most of the market. And um, tailors specifically, that's been a, a little bit of a tough nut to crack because our office has been spending, and interpretation, um, we've been spending so much time really trying to look into women in the needle trades and focusing more on um, not specifically tailors, although there were female tailors and tailoresses um, that looking to see how much clothing tailors were providing versus the women doing the sim slightly simpler but still involved garments. Um, more research to come on that. Awesome, thank you, Carrie. Uh, we had a few questions in relation to the village selling any clothing patterns from our collection. And I know Rebecca kind of mentioned that with our new publication coming out in the fall, but is there any other kinds of patterns we've sold before? I don't think we've had so much before and I might ask Jean to jump in on this one. Um, for clothing patterns, so something that is cut and sewn to make a garment, um, I don't believe that has been done before. It is something that our office, um, working really closely with the research and collections department, um, is looking at. It's, it's one of our longer term goals. And the book that Rock, Rebecca um, mentioned is, is kind of the first steps in that. Um, but yes, we would like to be able to, to do that more. Um, we do currently make them, as we have them, make them available for our volunteers and our staff that are doing their own personal projects, the so things they want to own versus what are assigned to them from our office and, um, and have been trying to make them available to other institutions as well. The challenge right now is that we have some really great patterns. So these, again, we've dozens and dozens and dozens of patterns and hundreds of sizes. 
that there's no instructions written into them. So right now it's, they're great if they're going to someone who's really familiar with historical clothing, but there's kind of no background um, ready to go right now. And that's, that's sort of what we're building in as well as looking for some of those historical details and um, provenance information to add back in. But yes, we hope to, we hope to making them more available um, in all shapes and forms. And correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca, but the dress that we made for Lindsay, that is one of the patterns that's gonna be in the book. Indeed so it is. I'm, yes. I'm pretty sure I still need to like trace <laughs> one more pattern piece off for it. Um, because obviously this has all been a last minute thing. Um, but yeah, so that's one. Um, it's a mix of men's and women's clothing, about six garments. Um, so it'll be the graft, those will be the graft um patterns, sort of similar to what um I shared of what Ray has done with the vest so far. But really excited about this. We want everyone to make 1830s clothing. So <laughs> Um, tied to that question, um, Linda is asking where she can obtain materials to make her own period garments. <laughs> Any insights? <laughs> Sorry, I'll take that one again. Um, so we, uh -oh. um, I personally am always shopping. Um, we do use a number of vendors that specialize in um, fabrics for living history sites. So um, uh, Burnley and Trowbridge is one that they have really well documented prints and um, woolens and linens. Um, so we certainly order some of our supplies from them. Um, the dress fabric that um, the pink dress was made for, for Lindsay, that came from a company called reproductionfabrics.com. In fact, the um, the company itself owns an 1830s swatch book. So they're the ones who actually have these reprints made. Um, Old Sturbridge Village, and actually I'll throw this back to Rebecca. Um, we have had partnerships with mm -hmm. um, quilt fabric companies in the past. Um, and I believe more might be coming maybe. Yes. Um, so quilt, quilting, quilting fabrics for our, our cottons, um, we search out the quilt markets for those, but I'll throw that one back to Rebecca. Yeah, we've been working um, actually for quite some time now. I think it goes back to 2005 with Marcus Fabrics out of New York. Um, so periodically, usually about once a year or so, they will physically come out, we'll show them um, quilts and fabric swatches and garments and any number of things we think would make really cool fabrics. Um, and they take some of those ideas back with them and create lines. Most recently, they've been doing kind of mixed lines. So some of our patterns will go in with other um, patterns from elsewhere. And of course, they are predominantly for quilting. So um, sometimes they'll tweak the scale a little bit or tweak the colors, but usually we end up with some really fantastic fabrics that we can use for our garments as well. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, one question is that you mentioned machine sewn seams. Do you require your contract workers to do all hand finishing like top stitching, hems and buttonholes? It depends. Um, we typically require hand finishing. So um, it, thing, necklines, um, hems are gonna be hand finishing. Um, buttonholes, we go back and forth on. So some things we do handwork buttonholes, some things we don't. It really depends on how and how the garment is being worn. So like we don't typically do hand on buttonholes on the um, pants or pantaloons because um, they just see too much abuse. And for the most part, they're covered with the bottom of the vest. So if we're making a pair that's going to be handled up close by visitors or like a dressing program or something where th that kind of detail would be noticed, we would, we would have the hand worked buttonholes. The other thing that we're doing a lot more of with our contract workers is having them make partial garments, and I wish I literally have several in my office, but they're all upstairs, um, is that we're having them make sort of um, not finish a whole garment. So for our dresses in particular, we might make, have them finish the whole bodice with the neckline, um, all of the piping, the sleeves, but leave the bottom part of the bodice unfinished, ungathered, un darted um, and then finish the whole skirt with the hem, attach it to a waistband, and then they'll leave it for us to attach the waistband to the bodice at the right point after the bodice has been fitted. Um, historically, the Old Sturbridge Village has not provided um, stays or corsets for its interpreters. That's something we're slowly introducing into the clothing that's assigned, which has been a really exciting transition, but um, corsets are expensive and are fairly custom fitted, so it's a slow process. But as we're able to get more of those onto our staff, 
we're, we're able to kind of get the bodices fit even better. And then that means any handwork is being done in our office. And yeah, we, we spend, um, in fact, if you can't see there, we have lovely wing back chairs behind us. Those are our sewing chairs where we just need to sit and do that kind of endless amount of hand sewing. Thank you. So this is more of an exhibit related question. Um, Kristen wants to know if there's a reason for not using mirrors in the exhibit so that viewers can see both the front and the back of the garments. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And in some exhibits, we definitely have used mirrors, um, especially when we want to be able to show the back. We didn't really consider it for this exhibit, I think partially because we've got so much glass and plexi that there were a lot of reflections already, um, which was creating some challenges as we were getting to the final stage, which was lighting the exhibit and making sure that each garment shined and also all of the labels and everything we needed to be well lit was. But definitely we have absolutely used mirrors, um, especially when we want to show the back. Um, I can think of one we've done recently. We've got this wonderful 1830s silk gown uh, that was worn um, according to the story by Hope Marino Potter for her wedding and then later altered in the back. So it had long sleeves with these beautiful scalloped um, and piped edge cuffs. And according to the story, one of the cuffs was taken off and the other one, I'm not sure what happened to it um, over the course of the history of this dress, but it was then sewn onto the back of the dress to expand the dress and it gives the dress about four inches or so of extra width. So as maybe she was changing shape a little bit over the course of her life. Um, so in that case, we definitely, we put that dress on display and put a mirror in so that you could absolutely see that back detail. Awesome, thank you. Um, Karen wants to know if we primarily dress interpreters in dresses or if we also use separates. So currently we're primarily using dresses. Um, we may move to more that are, you know, that are separate pieces, but they are attached when they're issued. Um, historically at the village, we have used more separates. Um, the, some of the research that our office has been doing, um, especially as Jean was referencing earlier about kind of working through the vocabulary and reading diaries and pulling out descriptions of garments and how they're being worn, especially focusing in on this late 1830s period that we, um, that we interpret our clothing around. Um, we're finding things like the um, short gowns and, um, and jackets that many people may be familiar with from um, pictures or visiting the village, worn oftentimes with denim petticoats, that that does seem to be a slightly, um, a throwback to a slightly earlier period. So we're not doing away with them by any means, um, but we are sort of trying to limit those to certain places in the village or to, um, I don't know how to put this delicately, but like interpreters of a certain age who are still holding on to, you know, if they're interpreting someone who is still holding on to some older styles and some older fashions. So putting it on somebody who, you know, would have been wearing that in their thirties, but is now in their sixties. Um, and not putting it so much on some of the um, younger presenting um, staff that we wear. By this time, historically, um, dresses sort of a, 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 the appearance of a single piece dress was more the norm um, than anything else. So we're um, trying to stay in that lane. Awesome. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. Um, this is from Jenny from Colonial Williamsburg. Um, do you find the draping methods for the 1830s are more similar to the way 18th century gown draping was done, or were there more standard shapes like you see in the Workwoman's Guide? That's a great question. And similar to sort of the, the lack of imagery and information on the 18th century, we're still running up against that in the, um, it, by the 1830s. Um, it really does start to change kind of after this period. Um, the Workwoman's Guide is one of the first places that you see bodice shapes like that. And even in some of the tailoring guides that have, um, that have women's clothing in them, it's very much drafted. Like they're, they're not, they're not talking about using other patterns. They're not talking about draping anything. Um, so what we've been able to pick up on, and this again goes back to some of that, the vocabulary that we've been working on building, um, is you, you, we read of people um, cutting a bodice to someone or um, I'm trying to think if we've seen, I feel like draping we've seen as well. I'd wanna go back and double check my records before I permanently went on online. Um, about that, but definitely um, cutting a bodice 
on a person, um, which in most cases refers to draping. So I'd say it still has a lot more similarities with um, what we'd be familiar with for the, the Colonial Williamsburg period, um, which is also my background well. So it's, it's a skill that translates very well and actually surprised us with the dress for Lindsay, um, how, how easy it was to just place the dart where we needed it um, to get the end result of the bodice shape to match the proportions. Um, and that's something that um, the taking a pattern off another garment or taking, you know, reusing a lining wouldn't have done for us as well as actually draping it on the person. So that seems to be more common. Thank you for the question and thanks for visiting from Williamsburg. <laughs> All right, unfortunately, that is all the time we have tonight. If you didn't catch the entire program or you would like to share it, a recording of the webinar will be sent to our members in the following week, and it will also be uploaded to the Old Sturbridge Village YouTube page. And for those of you who enjoyed this program and are interested in more, our next webinar, The Portraiture of Ezra Wilson, will be on September 21st at 6 p.m. And this is another grant-funded webinar, so it will be free to the public. And you can find more information and register for the webinar on our website. And again, I will also share the link in the chat box. And once again, a huge thank you to our presenters, Rebecca Bell, Jean Contino, and Carrie Majera. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you all have a great evening. <laughs>